Hello, my name is Aubrey Cavanaugh and I am Pause for Change. That's the name of my humane education website and also the volunteer work that I do to help animal shelters and rescue groups across the country. I have a blog on my website where I cover a host of topics that relate to companion animals and animal shelters, things that I think that the public needs to know so they can make better decisions and be better informed. I also blog periodically about books that I've read that I think people might be interested in. And today we're gonna to be talking with Kara Sue Ackerberg, who has a new book that's being released on July 7th. It is called 100 Dogs and Counting, One Woman, 10,000 Miles, and a Journey into the Heart of Shelters and Rescues. And the title alone tells you a lot about the book. It's incredibly compelling. Ordinarily, Kara would be able to do a book tour to speak with the public and introduce her book. With the pandemic going on, that's not gonna be possible this year. So I suggested to Kara that we do a Zoom chat instead. So we're gonna be covering a number of questions that relate to the content of the book, uh, some stories behind the book, and some things that have happened since the book was finished. So stay tuned, I hope you enjoy this. This is Aubrey Cavanaugh with Pause for Change. And like I said in my intro, today we are talking to author Kara Sue Ackerberg about her new book called 100 Dogs and Counting, One Woman, 10,000 Miles, and a Journey into the Heart of Shelters and Rescues. And boy, if that isn't a compelling title, title I don't know what it is. So, hey Kara, nice to see you via Zoom like the rest of the world is doing right now. So if you don't mind, let's just hop right into our questions. Um, in this Q&A, like I told people, we're just trying to get a little bit more information, things that they may not read in the book, or just your impressions. And the first thing I wanted to ask you about is um, in all the shelters and rescues and, and places that you went, you ran into a number of volunteers who um, helped in what I would consider regressive animal shelters. And they didn't want to speak out because they were afraid that they, if they did speak out about what they saw that they didn't like, that they would be denied access to animals. And I get the dilemma with that. I mean, it's almost like a catch-22. But um, in a way, do you see their silence as kind of their consent in some ways? I mean, they know better than others what's happening. So if they don't speak, what do you, what do you think about that? I think it is a catch-22. I think it's it's really hard. They're in this position where they are, in many times, the only, the only thing between a dog living and dying. And because of that, they really have to um, protect. You know, they have to be careful what they say. They have to... Um, Weigh, weigh their words. In fact, I know one situation, it was a, it was a pound in Tennessee and they had a distemper outbreak. And the person who had been going in there rescuing dogs tried to talk to them about, you know, having what they needed to do now at this point. And they didn't want to hear it. And so she went all above them. She went to the mayor of the town and told them. And what ended up happening was she's now denied access. She can't go in there to rescue dogs anymore. Nothing changed. You know, they're still they never did anything to clean it up, but she can't get in there. So her fear was true. And I hear that again and again. Um, and, and it's hard because if people don't know about it, they can't fix it. But if they talk about it, they might lose access and then the animals have no one. So it's tricky. Do, do, is, do you think the mayor's aware that she's been denied access? Uh, I would assume so. I would assume so. It's a teeny little town and, you know, he's buddies with the dog ward. They're not wardens. They are dog catchers in that county. That's interesting because there there are issues about free speech, about matters of public concern. So there's actually a federal law that precludes um, behavior like that from happening, but that's not to say it doesn't happen. I know it happens all the time. So I understand that there's a delicate balance between yeah. being outspoken enough and being so outspoken that you get cut off. So that's really that's that's really unfortunate. Um, le le that kind of leads us into our next one. Um, and you know I'm a I'm a I'm a no kill advocate, and I'm all about you know speaking out um, and, mm -hmm. and rocking the boat. Um, what do you see as the role of the public when it comes to trying to change shelter operations, as as opposed to the role of public officials to be preemptive? Where do you think the balance is with that? Well, it's in a public shelter. It's your tax dollars at work, so people people have a say. But if they don't know what's happening, then they don't say anything, and so. 
I do think it's up to the public to demand the change, but they aren't going to demand the change if they don't know the change is necessary. And that's been a lot of why, why I wrote my book, why I travel and continue to write about it and, and try to expose these things. Um, because if people don't know what's happening, they can't fix it. And they, and they might live, they might be huge dog loving people who always rescue. I have no idea. I had no idea the first time I went down there, no idea this was happening. And if I didn't know it, when I'm up to my eyeballs in rescue, then the general public doesn't know it. And so they need to know. And once they know, I, I do, I have faith in people. I think that they will demand that change. You know, and if your, your um, elected politicians don't listen to you, the elected officials don't hear you, well, then elect somebody different. Agreed. And you know what, I, sign me up on that list of didn't know. I mean, prior to becoming an advocate, I think I had presumptions about what happened in shelters. Not a clue, not a clue. And, and I, I hope you're right. I, I hope that, that once people learn, um, absolutely with the help of your book, to shine a light in the dark corners of what's going on, that they will be outraged enough that they'll own that outrage and they'll speak out. And if the public officials they talk to um, aren't, aren't acting on it, well, then they'll find new people. Okay, um, leading into the next one, and this one is kind of, this is a toughie. You write about a dog named Oreo, and there's a shelter where he was housed. Um, and they didn't want to release him because they say he was aggressive. And I remember you and I talking about this dog on the phone. Um, he clearly was not. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think that says related to the fate of other dogs like him, where, where shelters are so quick to label a dog as aggressive and have that as a reason to not let them out of the, the leave the building alive? It's really hard to assess a dog in a shelter situation. The dog isn't itself. I mean, dogs react, I mean, just like people would. You know, a person in prison isn't going to react. Mm -hmm. Hollywood. So a, a dog is, you're seeing probably the worst the dog can possibly be. And they're scared. And a scared animal is going to lash out. It doesn't mean it's an aggressive animal. It's, it's, it's just scared. And so that's such a hard thing to do, assess these animals. That's why fostering, for me, fostering is such an important, important piece of all of this, because that's where you can see what the dog is really like. And with Oreo, it was heartbreaking, because I'd met that dog and handled that dog and knew he was sweetheart and so did the people who had worked in the shelter but he was in a new shelter now and for them they saw a large dog that looked like he had pit bull in him and for mm -hmm. let's trigger they're just automatically scared and, and, and you dogs pick up on your your own fear they're going to pick up on that so it's sad you know if oreo could be labeled aggressive and potentially killed then there are a lot of the dogs being labeled aggressive and and killed because of you know, misunderstanding and the stress of being in a shelter. It's tragic. I believe it was Karen Delise that wrote that the way that dogs behave in shelters says a whole lot more about the shelter than it does about the animal, because you're correct. I mean, they're not going to behave the same way inside that building as they would outside a building. So it, it's unfortunate because I think it happens really quickly and dogs that either look a particular way or have some type of fear-based behaviors, they're just deemed aggressive and they may end up being one of those dogs that has, as you write in your book, a big X written on top of their kennel card, which means that they are not long for this world. Um, that leads into another one. Um, pit, pit bull type dogs are routinely destroyed in shelters across the country just for the way they look. Um, how much responsibility do you think the shelter system bears for failure to treat these dogs as individuals and market them based on their personalities and not how they look? Um, absolutely all of it, <laughs> most mm -hmm. of it. Um, we don't know what these dogs are. You have no idea unless you're doing a DNA. And even then, a lot of the DNAs are not that you know specific. And having never met the parents, all shelter people are guessing. I'm guessing as a foster, people always say, "What kind of dog is it?" And it's frustrating. And, and I can say, "Well, it appears to be or looks like," but I can't say what it is. I have no idea. And none of us do. And so it is. It's completely wrong that we would do this. That we would just connection got plenty. I hope you can still see me, but they, um, mm -hmm. it's just completely wrong that we would label a dog based on its appearance. It's just like people. We label people based on what we see without knowing them um, and not knowing who they are. And this happens to these pit, pit bull appearing dogs because there is no such thing as a pit bull. It's right. just a phrase. Um, but these dogs that have those characteristics, they are unfairly demonized and and continue to be routinely killed. And the only answer to that is for shelters to stop labeling them as such um, and just call them a mixed breed or all American dog. I've heard all these different terms, which are fine, which, which is great. Stop labeling these dogs and stop, you know, creating this, this culture of fear about them. 
Yeah, a, a lot of places have actually done that. And I, I know that you're right about this in your book that you in, had inquired about not labeling them that way. And I believe that what you were told was, well, when you put animals on pet finder, they want you to put a breed. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of actual shelter operations, I think a lot are turning that way. They're just calling them mixed breed dogs and they're focusing more on their personalities. And it actually has shown an effect. So um, people, sometimes people hear pit bull and that's it. They're, they're out, they're just onto the next animal. So let's hope that this is a trend um, and that more people will drop those labels. Um, your, um, reading your book, I was just amazed at the vast difference between places that you visited that were progressive, that were led by people with energy and fresh ideas, and places that were just so regressive that you would think it was 150 years ago. I mean, the gap was just incredibly wide. Um, and, and you wrote, that attitudes are a powerful force, and that quote kind of stuck with me. Um, do you see the differences in how these places operate as being um, entirely resource-based, or how much do you think leadership and culture play into the way these places operate? It's absolutely leadership. Absolutely, 100%. And I didn't think that going in. I thought, oh, we just need more money. We need more help. Mm -hmm. we, need more we need blah, blah, blah. And that's not the case. And I saw it multiple times. Saw it in South Carolina and in, in Anderson County, which is not a wealthy county. Um, the, uh, was it, they were fortunate to have a veterinarian take over as a director there, and they had been high, high kill shelter. I mean, they would take in a lot of dogs and um, open intake. And um, when Dr. Sanders got there, she just said, "We're not going to do this." And I asked her that question when we were there because I was amazed. She took that shelter from high kill to to really no kill, virtually no kill. Um, in about six months. Like, how do you do that in a large, large, probably one of the biggest shelters I saw. They, I think they house 175 dogs at a time, big shelter, right? And, and I said, how do you, how do you do that? And she was, she said, we just stopped killing dogs. Mm -hmm. Now we just have to find another answer. And they have a meeting once a month or once a week where they go over the numbers and they put them up, up and all the staff is there and they talk about, all, you know, their intakes and their outcomes and how they can fix this. And then I saw it again in Tennessee at a little um, shelter in Cheatham County, tiny $60,000 budget, mm -hmm. smaller scale. I mean, they're saving, I think they have 1,200 animals through that building yearly, which isn't big of a number, but their, num their kill numbers were super high. Um, and again, it's just hand-do director came in and was like, we're going to figure this out. And she said, I looked at what we did have instead of what we didn't have. It didn't have money. They didn't have a trained staff. They didn't have a big building, but they had a huge piece of property. And so they, they created all kinds of programs to bring the public out and it, it can be done. And she proved it and, and continues to prove it. And so it can be done. It takes leadership. It takes leadership committed to making Which it Which actually, I'm glad to hear you say that because that bodes well. Because what we hear a lot of time in no-kill circles is, oh, it's too expensive. It costs money. But then what we've seen repeatedly is it's really not about the resources. Yeah, if you have a lot of money in a great building, that may help. Um, but I, I know of places that have next to no budget, like the one that you talked about, where they save a lot of animals because it's a matter of attitude. But then I've seen large, beautiful shelters that have a lot of people and they're destroying a lot of animals. So the, the, the building and the money are not always the answer. So I'm glad that you actually saw that because that kind of bore out what I've, what well, I've I always I saw it thought. again and again. I saw in Alabama too, a beautiful shelter that had, I mean, it was a little dated, but a huge shelter that has over a million dollar budget and is killing 10,000 dogs a year. Mm -hmm. Cause it's this, you know, it's the attitude. They kill the pit bulls on intake. They kill the pregnant mm -hmm. dogs. The dogs, any dog, ringworm, anything, any excuse, um, they deem it unadoptable and they kill it. And yet they have over a million dollar budget. So, well, which which means it all comes down crazy. to leadership, yeah. which actually leads into the next thing. You know, I'm a huge proponent. Having read my book, you're you know, I'm a pro proponent of a thing called the no kill equation, which is a series of programs that work to reduce shelter intake and increase shelter output. And um, you write about Maury County a couple of times in your book, um, mm -hmm. and, and I realized the last time you were there was more positive than the prior occasion, but um, I had to shake my head when I was reading about Maury County that, that took in animals without any type of question, where there was no barrier to them taking in animals. They weren't doing anything, any type of pet retention, um, counseling to keep pets in existing homes. It was just like, yeah, bring them on. Um, do you think that sometimes these shelters make it too easy for people to give up their animals and thereby perpetuate the process? I think sometimes they do. Maury's definitely better than they were. Um, I don't know what all their programs are now, but I would, I would definitely say they're not quite as open intake as they once were. 
Um, but I do think the shelter has a responsibility and I think they want to keep the animals with the people if they can. So they have to ask the questions. They have to offer some assistance. Mm -hmm. Another great example of where they partner with them. They're like, we'll figure out a way to, to make it so you can keep your animal. They have a homeless man who takes his dog once a month um, and gets its heartworm treatment and they gave him a bag of dog food and they let him use their grooming facility so he can give him a bath. Give him a bath. And you know, most places would take that dog from a homeless person, but as the director there said, he, that dog lives better than my dogs. With a person 24-7, you know, its life revolves around its person and the person's life revolves around that dog and it's great life. Instead of taking that dog and saying, you can't afford it, they found a way. And as she pointed out, it's cheaper for me to do this than to take this dog. And then, you know, we have to find a home for it. We have to treat it for heartworm. We have to neuter it. Well, they did neuter it. Um, we have to do all of these things. And that's a cost right there, whereas leaving it with its owner. And there's a lot of ways that you can keep it, keep a dog with its owner. You just have to be creative. You have to be willing to work with them and see these people as um, not bad people because they're giving up their pet, but people who are just in a tough spot. And, and maybe there's a way to make this work through training or or resources. It's, it's an emotional thing and I know from experience with some people that I've known that they've they I, I know some people one of which is a family member who at one point was so desperate that she was going to surrender her cat to a shelter but because she was so emotional about it there were behavioral issues going on that she felt she simply couldn't overcome and her vet had, had recommended she have a cat euthanized and I had to say okay let's stop take a take a breath let's slow down and let's work through the issue and I think that shelters can do that also. Uh, let's talk about Gala for a minute and um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, but she is a dog that is clearly central to the story of your book and why you took these trips and you wanted to see where dogs like her were coming from. And I don't want to give away too much what happened with her story, mm -hmm. but um, she clearly helped change her life path, I would say, um, even though your efforts to help her were, were just really an incredible struggle. If you could say one thing, like if she understood every word you said, mm -hmm. and you, you could say one thing to her about what you learned from her, what would you say to her? So it's such a hard one because I still am learning from Gayla. I'm still thinking about her, um, even though she is in a wonderful home now, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. Uh, I, I would just say thank you for being so patient with me. And um, gosh, one of the smartest dogs I've ever encountered, for sure, that dog. Absolutely. Um, and I, I really just would say thank, thank you for your patience and thank you for putting up with all the ways I screwed up and didn't understand and didn't listen. Um, it's taught me to, to listen a lot better to other dogs, to take it from their point of view instead of wanting the dog to be what I want it to be. I'm trying to see the dog as who the dog is. Yeah, I think people are really going to enjoy reading about her. So, um, yeah, I, I'm glad to hear you say that. I mean, I, 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 I think her story is compelling. And like I told you in an email, I mean, that's one smart dog. I think she was, mm -hmm. I think she was testing you at every turn. But I mean, I think that good came from it because she was the impetus for a lot of things that happened. Um, part of why we're doing this is because with the pandemic, I mean, you can't um, go out and do a book tour. So. I, I was wondering, um, I know a lot of hard, people have a hard time hearing about the fact that dogs die in shelters. And I know that when you do talk to people about your books that they have um, a hard time with hearing the subject matter. And, and you write that one person heard you say that you met good dogs that are dead now and that person recoiled. Um, how do you think that we impart this information to the animal loving public that needs to know about it, but without losing them? How, how do we keep them engaged on a sub that, that's just really difficult to hear about. You know, this, is a, this was a struggle for us when we were working on this book. My editor basically said, you have to balance it. That's why a good portion of the beginning of the book is about Gala and about the fosters that come through our home and about that end, because that's the happy end. That's the end where you get to see the happy ending, you get to see the happy faces and the dogs that make it out. And, and, but the other end is the end that we have to fix. Um, fostering, I think, is always going to be with us because it's the best way to get a dog in the right home, in my opinion. Um, but we have to tell people and they have to know. So in writing the book, I'm hopeful that they'll read about Gala and they'll read about my foster dogs and what we've gone through and they'll trust me. And then they'll go with me to the shelters to see what happens. Because if you don't go down there and you don't see it, you don't read about it, you don't look at the pictures, you don't, you, you'll, we'll never fix, you can't fix a problem you don't know exists. So we have to talk about it as hard as it is 
Now, when I first started working on the book, I thought, I can't write a book about shelters. It's so sad. No one want to read it. And um, I'm hopeful this book isn't sad. It's hopeful. I mean, I believe this is a fixable problem, but we can't fix it until we know about it. So we have to first dive deep and learn what's really going on and, and then look for this. Just, just say, oops, we had an interruption there. Sorry, we're, we're back now. We had my phone <laughs> ring. I apologize for that. Um, duty calls. Um, but I, I agree with you. And, and I'm glad that, that you talk about being direct. And I realized at one point in your book, you, you said that what happens to these healthy animals, it's not euthanasia, it's actually killing them. And even though it's hard for people to hear that, they need to hear it because until they hear it, they can't, they, they don't, they don't know like you and I didn't know. So we need to, we need to help them understand. Um, uh, a lot of people who read your book are going to learn for the first time, like you and I did, what's happening in these shelters. And um, it's going to be difficult for them to learn about. But once they have that knowledge, um, and maybe they will learn what happens at their own shelter, what are you hoping that they do with that knowledge? I'm hoping to ask a lot of questions. I'm hoping they, they understand now what terms like intake and, um, and you know, euthanasia or space or aggression. I'm hoping they understand what those terms really mean. And, and now that they have that information, they can ask the questions about the intakes and the outcomes at their own shelter and shelters around them. And I'm hoping that they will get involved. Um, they'll be motivated to foster, to volunteer, because that's really what it takes is, is the, the people coming into the shelters and helping. And if they run into the shelter where they can't, that can't happen, then I hope they can on the, the road to fixing the problem. I agree. I agree. Okay. And, and last one here, um, and just bringing us up to speed, um, COVID-19 crisis, we've, it's led to more people fostering animals. And I think that, that you've even seen that. I think you told me in an email that the, that the rescue group that you help has a whole, a whole new group of foster people on board. Um, and, and people are learning how they can help shelter pets so that they can be placed in new homes. And I like to think that, that this crisis has created a new connection between the animal sheltering system and rescues on one side and the animal loving public that may not have been aware in the past and that they're now learning, hey, I can help and I can help in small ways to get animals in new homes. Um, do you think that this bodes well for us moving forward, that this crisis has created a connection in bringing people together with the animals and, and do you think that's just going to move forward and be a positive thing? I'm hoping, I'm hoping it's a silver lining amidst all of this is that there's so many people stepping up to foster and adopt. I mean, we've adopted out nearly as many dogs as we adopt out in a year in like two months. It's crazy uh, how fast it's happening, you know, and then everyone's bracing themselves, assuming there's going to be a lot of returns when life resumes. Uh, I'm hopeful that won't be the case, that they've had this time at home and, um, and they will. So I, I really do hope it's opened some eyes. At the same time, I, I know the situation hasn't changed in the South. I know just as many animals are coming in um, in some of these shelters. Um, because while it's wonderful that there are shelters emptying out in a lot of the urban areas in the Northeast and like parts of Florida even, that's phenomenal. Like it's an incredible, incredible experience and undoubtedly it's going to change things. But at the same time, I'm still reading the emails and the desperate pleas for help from these places in the deep south, especially uh, in the poor counties and in the shelters where they have aggressive leadership. It's still happening. I mean, in fact, some of them are using it as an excuse to euthanize because they can't bring their staff in. And, um, some rescues are not driving south because they are afraid. And so, you know, with less dogs leaving and the same number coming in, it, the, it's compounding the problems for some of the shelters in the south still. But at the same time, it is great. It is awesome to see so many dogs finding homes and so many people starting to foster. And I'm sure some of them will stick around. Not all, but I hope a lot of them. No, I, I agree with you too. And I've got to say that I think that um, once people read your book and they read about your experiences, um, which you did, you handled very delicately. I mean, you saw a lot of stuff that just had to be incredibly upsetting that just kind of, you, like the phrase goes, you can't unsee it, right? You can't unhear it. Um, you can't go back once you know something, but you handled it with grace and with dignity. And my hope is that once people read your book and they have a greater awareness of what's happening, that they'll know not, not just what happens in the areas where you visited, but they will ask those questions like you talked about. And I think that you are bringing more people to the table to give them that awakening, that awareness. And the more people who know, um, the more things will change. I don't remember the exact quote from your book, but 
but I think that you wrote, it's not that people don't care, they just don't know, and you're gonna help them know. Kara, mm -hmm. thank you so much for spending some time with me today. Sorry about the interruption that we had. Um, I will have details in my blog, folks, for how you can pre-order her book, which is due to be released on July 7th, and then you also can go back and find her prior book, which is Another Good Dog, One Family and 50 Foster Dogs, which is just an amazing look at the life of fostering that her entire family is engaged with for many years. Um, Kara, thanks for your time, and be safe. Thanks. Thank you, Aubrey. Okay, bye. Bye.